What's up, punks? This is Shinobi, and we are bringing you a special edition of Block Digest with Harry Helpin from NIM Technologies. Uh, so, what's going on today, Harry? Hey, what's up? How's it going? Glad to be on the show. Going all right. Um, Janine, well, what's going on with you today? Uh, just holding down a cat for eating our food. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, you know, NIM Technologies is working on a new uh, MixNet, um, kind of a Tor network alternative um, based on the Lupix protocol. And I'm sure there's, there's a couple different layers of stuff regarding uh, that that we're going to get into today. But I think we kind of wanted to just, uh, you know, start off with a little free flow about Bitcoin history. And uh, I don't know, some conspiracy theories, maybe? Is that that appropriate title for that? I don't think it's it's a conspiracy theory. I, I think, um, I mean, effectively, the sort of surveillance that uh, was, which is almost definitely going to get far, far worse after the Corona crisis than it was before, and the sort of um, you know mass surveillance efforts at the NSA and whatnot that revealed were were revealed by Snowden. You know, people predicted these kinds of problems almost at like the dawn of digital. Uh, internet, you know, connection and cryptography themselves. Um, and it's not crazy, right? So um, I used to work at MIT. I took my uh, my crypto course from Ron Rivest. And, you know, one day I asked them, I said, well, you know, did cryptographers take the NSA, you know, seriously as uh, as a threat? And he said, yeah, of course we did. He said, you know, when I tried to publish my first paper, and Ron is not a political radical by any stretch of the imagination but he's like when i tried to publish my first paper on public key crypto you know the nsa you know i got a letter saying i shouldn't i shouldn't publish this and so there's always been a kind of repression of free speech um particularly free speech by cryptographers um since the kind of birth of the field now i mean unfortunately what happened is particularly in the united states uh computer science and cryptography funding is controlled to a large extent by the uh, National Science Foundation, DARPA, essentially the U.S. government, particularly the U.S. military industrial complex. And uh, most people just got with the program over time. Um, a few of the more famous cryptographers, I uh, particularly look at Phil Rogaway's moral character cryptogra cryptographic work, uh, you know, resisted military funding, but a lot of people just got sucked in. And one of the most interesting early cryptographers um, was David Chom, uh, who is definitely hustling his own coin right now, this weird XX coin. But I think what people often, uh, David Chom had one of the most uh, profoundly uh, creative academic 10 year, uh, 10 year sprints, where within a, in a short series of papers, uh, starting in 1981, uh, with the the absolutely uh, groundbreaking paper, let's see if I remember the name. Um, untraceable electronic email return addresses and digital pseudonyms, which I think came out of his PhD, uh, he basically said, well, look, we can create anonymous email, untraceable email against even very powerful adversaries like the NSA. The NSA was something they had kind of in the back of their minds in the, in the early 80s when they were doing this original cryptographic work. Uh, you know, so this predates PGP and the kind of 90s crypto wars. And then, you know, in short order, uh, David also uh, produced um, the, the earliest work around anonymous uh, digital payments. So he introduced this concept called blind signatures. He's in this paper, not surprisingly. Drink. Uh, Sorry, yeah, it's, exactly. it's a drinking game. I'm okay. obsessed with Chom and eCash, and everybody says you have to drink when I when I say Chom or eCash. Yeah, I mean Chom and eCash. I I still think we're I still think it's kind of the way forward to some extent. It, it has problems, um, and Bitcoin actually corrects a number of those problems, but we still haven't got all the properties we want out of eCash. So, yeah, I mean blind signatures for untra untraceable payments, and then um, another paper. I think this is maybe the the final of the, like the kind of Chom trifecta. Uh, a paper on anonymous authentication credentials called uh, Security Without Identification, uh, literally subtitled uh, Transaction Systems to Make Big Brother Obsolete. So these are like obviously pretty politically charged 
papers, where Chom is clearly very worried about privacy, way back when basically almost no one was using the internet. And then, you know, the cypherpunk nexus, they looked at all these papers and they said, well, look, there's something really political going on here. Um, and they formed their mailing list. And then folks like, uh, particularly Adam Back, I think, you know, were doing open source implementations uh, of this work. And so essentially you had uh, what I would call like a, a tech, three sort of fundamental technologies. Uh, one, and these are all based around identity and payments and privacy. Uh, one is the concept of, in order to make anything private, you have to defend the network level. You have to defend the, the, the connections in TCP IP or perhaps UDP nowadays, uh, which are going between machine to machine from IP address to IP address. And the pattern of those of those connections and those bytes sent over the wire. So that's where mixnets came in. Uh, then the, the second thing is eCash. You have to have some ability to send payments in a private manner. And lastly, you might want to generalize that so you can prove anything in a privacy enhanced fashion. You know, prove I'm, you know, the classic example seems to be something related to either drinking or porn, you know, prove I'm over 18 or over <laughs> 21. But I mean, these are kind of big problems. And um, and it's interesting when you can kind of step back, the only one that's from the original kind of none of Chom systems really uh, saw the light of day in mass usage in their original form. But, you know, Bitcoin clearly traces itself back to all the early eCash work. And uh, Bitcoin is the big success story. But I don't think we should forget about these other two technologies that Bitcoin and to some extent what I call the political project of the cypherpunks. Um, and the crypto anarchist is not complete unless you get all of those technologies together. So you need network level privacy, you need you need uncensorable electronic cash, and you need um, a way to prove things anonymously. And if you, currently all we have is uncensorable electronic cash, we have Bitcoin, and we have other technologies like Tor that kind of do the first job. And nothing, mm. at least that's deployed, that does the, the third job. But we're, we're you know, that, that's kind of how I view the, the space as a whole. See, I see Tor less of a, a solution to that problem as a stopgap. Like, it, it'll protect the integrity of the information. It'll protect the contents, potentially, if the endpoints are safe. But any kind of adversary or threat model like the NSA or something of that magnitude, they may figure out where shit's flowing in there like that. Like if, if they can monitor the whole network, it is not actually creating that complete unlinkability. It's just protecting the contents. Yeah, and, and the, the Tor paper says that. So the, the Tor paper uh, says that you know we are only interested – we, we can't defeat an adversary, a global adversary that can monitor the whole network. And I don't think that was um, Tor being malicious. I think when Tor came out, you know, around 2000 or so, uh, the internet was just slower. And the use cases that were being propped up were mostly around what's called, you know, trying to get, you know, people who can't get, have internet access to get internet access in places like Iran or other uh, countries on the U.S.'s shit list. And um, I think that's what kind of led to Tor. But you have to remember that the original creators of Tor, uh, particularly uh, Roger Dingledy and Nick Matthewson, I mean, they were very much cypherpunks and still are to a large extent. And they actually worked with NIM's co-founder, George Denisis, who's uh, unfortunately left us for Libra, but that's a whole other story. Uh, they were working on, on cypherpunk anonymous email remailers, and particularly Mixminion. So they were actually working on Mixnets. But at the time, the problem that Tor had, Tor said, well, we could have this unlinkable internet, but it was, it wasn't, they didn't think it was going to work, mainly because there was no clear way. If I send an anonymous email to you, it was not clear how you could anonymously respond and therefore, you never know if your email got delivered. So very few people end up using these technologies. Um, and that led, I think, to the people from Tor saying, I, I've, I've discussed this with Nick. Um, Nick saying, well, look, I just want to be able to get privacy on the things I actually do. And, you know, and those two things are mostly web browsing and using SSH. And the bet of Tor was that 
uh, onion routing could give you maybe not privacy against the NSA, but like some privacy while maintaining high speeds, which were needed for web browsing on essentially a uh, internet pipes, which were at that point pretty low capacity. So a lot of the techniques from mixed networks, um, mixed networks differ from Tor um, because they mix the traffic. They, they mix it like a deck of cards. They add a reorder of that when that adds latency. And if there's not enough traffic, they sometimes, this is particularly what we do now, that nowadays, add in fake traffic, dummy traffic, cover traffic, call it what you will. And that mixed networks are based on a, a vision of the internet is, is, is a bit more like email, based on, on messages. And so you have these messages coming through and being mixed and then shot out in a different order and mixed and shot out in a different order. And that is resistant to the NSA, but it didn't seem like a realistic way to do web browsing. Uh, particularly in 2000. So I think that's why people went with Tor. Um, that being said, yeah, I do think at this point, um, I do think Tor might be about as good as we can get for web browsing. Um, that being said, for other things, we we are at the point in the internet's history where we can get a resistance to global adversaries, and that's why we're trying to build a mixnet over at NIM because we think it's time to, to restart that. Yeah, I think, you know, this would be kind of a, a good spot to kind of break down the the actual technical differences between traffic handling in Tor and uh, Lupix that you're using for NIM, you know, just for people not autistically familiar with all of this. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll I, I break it down real quick. So the way to think about Tor um, so is not that it's like a magical um, black box that just makes you anonymous, but that what it does, it's kind of like a VPN, but it has different hops. It has multiple hops, and it establishes a circuit that rotates every 10 minutes or so. Um, and these hops, so your traffic goes from your computer and is shuffled to through what's called a Tor guard or entry node into a Tor relay, and it hops between, you know, a, one Tor relay to another. Um, there's only three hops usually because that keeps it fast. And then you go out, a Tor exit, and then you access the web. And if you use what's called a Tor hidden service, you know, WikiLeaks, for example, was a Tor hidden service. WikiLeaks, to some extent, was the killer app of Tor, actually. Uh, you have a hidden service, you know, uh, uh, Pirate Bay or uh, what was it called? Sil uh, Silk Road. All these things were hidden services. These are networks which are inside Tor in which you route your traffic, not outside, but inside the system. But it's important to remember Tor that it's based on onion routing, which is very good technology. Onion routing basically adds layers of encryption. You put them on, you choose your relays, and you ship that packet. So let's say I have three re relays. I put three onion layers of encryption on top of it, and each relay I, I take one off and then finally pops out into either the hidden service or the wide internet and the clear. And that produces, uh, and that happens with every packet, basically. But but in order to get these kind of high speeds, it opens a circuit. So it's a bi-directional circuit. Communication go back and forth. Um, and it, that's just a very different model than what mixed nets do. So mixed nets don't think of the world as uh, – they don't really think about VPNs. They don't really think about circuits. Uh, they're what's called message-based traffic. So they do something very similar to onion routing. They use a at least modern mixed net technology. It uses a packet format called the Sphinx packet format, which is also, interestingly enough, used in Lightning. And I've, I've never got Elizabeth Stark anyone to tell me exactly why, but I think they were just looking for a good encrypted packet format and they chose Sphinx. But how Sphinx works, and I'm using a mixnet, I do something similar. I wrap up my, um, my message in a Sphinx packet. I choose my path through the mix network. But at each hop, rather than just sending it to the next hop like Tor in a kind of first in, first out uh, method, I, col I collect the packets. I wait until I get enough packets. And then I re release those packets in a different order uh, than they come in. In mathematical terms, you could think of it as a, a permutation. Um, and, if, and, and maybe I don't want to wait for packets forever, in which case I can add fake packets and you do two or three mixes even one mix is often fine but you do two or three mixes uh and you get a, a very kind of high level a 
of anonymous communication. And Lupix does a number of tricks you can go into to, to kind of speed that process up, to make it efficient. Uh, it's more statistical than I think David Chom's original work. So if you want like a good old fashioned uh, standard MixNet, uh, David Chom's Elixir software is a fairly standard Chomian mix. Uh, and what we do is more statistical uh, and Lupix and a NIM. Uh, but nonetheless, the concept's the same, which is you take messages in, you reorder them, you may, and that reordering adds delay, and then the messages actually come out in a different order. And that's what gives you the resistance uh, to a global passive adversary like the NSA or someone who's recording all the inputs and outputs. Because if, if you're looking at Tor, I'm looking at just the inputs and the outputs, you know, I can get the same, if a, the pattern of traffic coming in has the same pattern as the traffic coming out, which is going to be the case for, say, 10 minutes or so, and I happen to be monitoring both the entry and exit nodes, uh, then I can identify your traffic. And I could do that if I'm, for example, even looking at a hidden service, and I'm monitoring all the traffic into a server, which we think is a hidden service. So unless I'm trying to find Silk Road, I want to look at the traffic patterns coming out of an individual's uh, hidden service, I can do the same technique. And um, that's a, a pretty large weakness, we think, uh, from, a, from an angle. Now, Tor would respond that, that not so really, because what Tor requires is Tor says, well, if you just have enough entry exits and enough exit nodes, you have enough of these entry and exit nodes, you have thousands, you have this huge diversity, it's highly unlikely a real world enemy will break them all. But we say, we don't know about that anymore. We think the NSA, and it's true, the NSA couldn't break Tor. Uh, when the Stoner Revelations happened, I actually came out the slide that says Tor stinks. I had no idea how to break Tor, and they were doing a bad job. Everyone was actually kind of surprised they were so bad at breaking Tor. And this is like 2013, 14. But, you know, that's been five years ago, right? So the amount of monitoring that they can do, or you can do on a smaller network, like Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer network via chain analysis, is much larger. So that's why we think MixNets it really changes the, the, the flow and the pattern of the packets are necessary nowadays. So that, yeah, that's uh, sorry, that was probably a bit too much, but that's my explanation. No, I'm too. actually gonna gonna try to pull uh, more out of you. Um, <laughs> so, like uh, another difference, kind of between the the Lupix architecture and the the Tor architecture, is kind of this notion of a static service provider to go in and out of the network. And I think that that's kind of a a workable solution here, you know, especially given the the nature of packet timing being shuffled and the dummy traffic, but it, it does kind of create like a little last mile difference in the anonymity. If you kind of want to dive a little bit through the the user and service provider relationship, yeah. So this is stuff that was added more recently. So um, you know, there have been. Uh, peer peer to peer uh, mix nets. I think the probably the the latest design that was at least academically verified was called DRAC. So you got to understand, it's been lots of work in mix nets for like 30, 40 years. And Lupix is the latest design. And Lupix basically takes all the insights of probably you know the one of the more uh, prolific mix net designers called George Denisis, who co-founded NIM, and he basically distills them. And he said, well, the main problem of law mix nets so is with uh, a the like, MIT's Vuvuzela, for example, was a mix that design that no one uses. He said, well, you know, in order to get good anonymous communication, you're assuming the user has to be online all the time. But that's not the case for many users, particularly people on mobile devices. And also, uh, you have to be able to capture the, you know, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a circuit. It's not a tunnel to the web. Like you said, these packet these 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 messages are coming in. They have to be kind of reassembled to get your um your full your your full original packet. So George and Anya, who currently also works for NIM, introduced in Lupix this concept of a provider. Uh, we still have this in NIM, and this provider basically the way you think about it from an email perspective, it's almost like an email server inbox, but they don't know who you're talking to or what you're doing. You can use multiple of them and every app can have multiple of them as well. They just basically let you connect, drop off messages for the MixNet, and then at the other side, uh, reassemble them. And another problem with MixNets historically 
is that there's no way to tell if your message ever got delivered. That's a total pain. And you might also want to reply to messages, but you want to reply to those things anonymously. So uh, Lupix and NIM, they, we have two other features. Uh, one is we, just as you know, in TCIP, I send a packet, a SIN, and I get an acknowledgement or ACK back. So we do the same thing with loop traffic. So that's why that's called Lupix. The traffic loops to the service provider and then through various mix nodes, and they send loop traffic back to what's called a SERB or single use reply block, which is an anonymous address inside of the mixnet that then the user can retrieve uh, their packet from. And that's really, I think, a really nice solution because you get a lot of the advantages of normal TCP IP, you know, you know if your packet made it or not. You get to be anonymous, you have these single use reply blocks, and essentially, Unlike Tor, which is like way, way I think as a tunnel to the open internet, and Lupix, because it's provider system, every app is basically has to be a hidden service. Every app has to have these providers which reassemble the packets and then they retrieve them, you know, whenever they want. And uh, they can have multiple. And I think that's a that's a good design choice, actually. Um, it's it basically forces people to make at least the mixnet facing part of their application anonymous. Um, so we're, I'm a big fan of that design choice. And it, by basically the providers are more likely to be online all the time than your end user's app. Um, there is a minor weakness, which is something we're investigating, which is how much can the correlation between you being online and maybe a receiver being online um, how much does that leak? So if you know you're you're using a phone once a month, and your other friends only using a phone once a month, maybe that you can, you know, the, the, there is still timing and pattern attacks about when the end user or even app could connect to the provider, um, and those are important. But that being said, by virtue of keeping those providers online all the time, you get all these nice loops, you get cover traffic, and between providers, you get definitely get resistance to NSA scale global adversaries. And that's, I think, a, a higher, far higher degree of anonymous communication than we can achieve in any other way. Yeah, and you know, you know, kind of the, the issue with like the, the provider and what they can glean out of that. You know, like one of the first things I was thinking when I, I got through that section of the, the paper was, why can't you compose things like Lupix with Tor? Like, why couldn't I connect to a service provider uh, for Lupix through a Tor circuit or something like that and just kind of add the the layers of, of disconnection if that's a concern for any user? Yeah, if you, if you don't trust the provider, you could always hop through multiple um, hops before getting there. We actually have in uh, NIM, unlike Lupix, we actually add a layer to do this which we call the mix gateways. So these essentially act to secure the traffic between the user and the mix network itself. But yeah, you could compose the entry and exits with Tor um, and, and, and get a much higher degree of anonymity than Tor itself would give you. So that's, that's, uh, that's definitely true. And the, 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 I think it's important to explain why the pure peer-to-peer -peer model has issues. So intuitively you would say oh peer to peer model would be better but the problem with pure peer to peer models in terms of anonymous communication systems is in order to be anonymous you really have to be the same you have to be the same you have to be each packet must be treated in the same way because if a packet is treated differently if there's difference in timings and difference in numbers of packets then you can de-anonymize that stream of packets and so the way you do if you have a peer-to-peer -peer network where maybe I'm going to pass your packet forward, maybe I'm just going to drop it, maybe some packets get go through five servers, five peers, some packets only go through two, maybe, you know, this is going to, th this easily allows global adversaries like the NSA to de-anonymize your traffic. So what you really want to do to get anonymy with, like, say, Bitcoin is I want to send an anonymous, let's say, Bitcoin transaction, or I connect to maybe Vitor to a mix gateway. I send my traffic through. It goes to service provider, provider, and then the provider then broadcast after the packets go through the mix network and they're reassembled, they then broadcast that out using standard TCP IP uh, broadcasting to the rest 
of the Bitcoin network, and that breaks the link between the user and the rest of the Bitcoin network. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, like, absolutely. Like, that's one of the most interesting things about MixNuts to me is using that to kind of get around the the lack of encryption on the Bitcoin peer to peer protocol, because like that is an absolutely huge issue when it comes to network correlations to people's on chain activities. But like even a step further, um, you know, things like Lightning Network uh, seem to me to be pushing Bitcoin in an interactive direction in terms of the process of transacting. So there, I think it's it's 10 times as important as taking those precautions on chain. And I think those are going to be the dominant modes of transaction in the future. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had a few, you know, we have people from Lightning Labs in our dev channel, and we've even met them in person. And, you know, we haven't, uh, one of our researchers just did a, uh, Anya just did, the same person that did Lupix just did a great privacy analysis of Lightning Network. The answer is it's not so great right now, but in theory, it could be really good. And the reason is by doing a lot of things off chain and then kind of writing it on chain only once you've reached a certain number, uh, you could in theory use Lightning to get a lot better privacy on uh, on Bitcoin. And we like Lightning because it uses Sphinx packet format, which is the same packet format we use. So it's a little bit easy on the interop front. The the, the problem with Lightning uh, is 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 again, you know, if I have I, I need to basically escrow Bitcoin, the hot wallet have my IP address, you know, the, the lack of privacy, we think actually prevents more uptake of lightning than there could be. So we hope by, this is maybe further down our dev roadmap, but, you know, we hope by eventually integrating NIM and lightning more closely together, we can make lightning more private um, and make Bitcoin more private um, and more. And I think this is a, a kind of win-win situation because, the thing with a mixed net and any kind of anonymous communication system, and this is where Tor has a real advantage, is the more people that use it, the more anonymous you are. So if there's only you and Edward Snowden talking over this thing, it doesn't matter how great the system is because if there's only two users, you're screwed if someone's watching a network. But the more Bitcoin transactions that go through NIM, the more just like a standard mixer, the more anonymous everyone's network level traffic is. So this kind of, you know, and, and the nice thing about NIM is we also want to expand. Uh, it's a generic system, so it's not specialized for Bitcoin, so we can expand to other kinds of traffic. You know, I have been chatting a bit to Moxie. Uh, I've been chatting to all sorts of uh, all sorts of folks. And we think that, you know, if we can get instant messaging traffic, other kinds of traffic, email even, uh, through the system, that provides a larger amount of um, anonymity uh, to uh, to Bitcoin users. Yeah, I think that that would be excellent. Like, I, I think a, a big problem with how people think about privacy is like they just want a magic thing to route all of their traffic through. And I think it'd be a lot more intelligent to just think in terms of single applications and their traffic and like what needs anonymization, what can be anonymized most effectively in what way. And I think you know, th things like NIM are like, why is all the communications traffic not moving to things like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, some traffic is going to be hard to do in a mix net, like, you know, web traffic, for example. So I kind of personally think Tor is going to remain dominant in that space unless the mix nets become much faster, which we have some research results in and, you know, about how you could basically change things in the routing level to to make mix nets pretty fast. Of that being said, uh, what we're trying to build here at NIM is a battle plan to make more and more apps anonymous by kind of onboarding them one by one. Um, so, you know, we've been, you know, we, we have a lot of interest from Bitcoin, uh, wallet devs, you know, Amir Taki a huge supporter. Uh, we have interest from people doing side chains, uh, particularly very interested in, in, in liquid and, you know, trying to integrate NIM on elements. Uh, you know, we have that interest uh, from, I mean, the Ethereum Foundation has been pretty uh, not uh, pretty useless, but we have had interest from from Zcash uh, and from apps that run uh, like Status. Uh, so we've had a lot of interest. I think we're trying to build that battle map out n now. And you know, to be honest, we we try to remain neutral, but we also want to go after people who 
share the same philosophy as us. So that's a lot of Bitcoin people, I think, have a more pro-privacy philosophy than what I've seen from other communities, like the Ethereum community. And we're also aiming for apps that, to be honest, have nothing to do with Bitcoin to have a lot of users. So I would, you know, sacrifice my 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 left nut to get Signal to use the MixNet. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to be able to process, you know, scale up to a billion users, which we think we could do. But it's just, you know, it's going to require a much larger network than the test network we're running now. Um, so, you know, we're pretty open. A lot of privacy uh, coins such as Monero and Zcash uh, community members are also uh, running nodes. But so are a lot of um, uh, Bitcoin folks are running nodes. Um, like Blockstream, for example. So for us, it's all about maximizing the amount of anonymity you get. In the long run, uh, my general thesis is we I don't think there's actually room for different cryptocurrencies. Um, I personally probably think if the latest round of modifications put forward by Blockstream, particularly Taproot, uh, Schnorr, and a few other things actually get into Bitcoin Core, um, I think the use case for other privacy coins and other coins in general may decline over time, or probably will decline over time. And the the reason is is pretty simple. Um, it's it's not because uh, any other real reason, because all the value is already in Bitcoin. There's already so many users and so much money on chain that it kind of just dwarfs everyone else. And there's no reason why you if, if that 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 value is not going to transfer. Uh, we think at least easily to another chain, and we still need no reason uh, why it would. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you just got to, got into a little uh, little troll fest in the chat box. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> but um, I I think Janine had uh, something she wanted to go into a little bit with the the team at Nim uh, before I kind of try to shove us along to some of the coconut stuff. Yeah, so um, you probably don't remember me, but we actually met briefly. Um, it was you and George uh, in London. I can't remember. I think it was two years ago, maybe. Oh, it was probably and, just starting. Yeah. Yeah, and um, when I met you, you guys were discussing something that um, it was right before the mobile coin white paper got published uh, from uh, Moxie. And so when that paper came out, I I actually mistake I I mean I don't maybe you were but I mistakenly thought that you were involved in that because it sounded very similar, and the oh god the mobile coin white paper was so frustrating to me, um, and I've heard that it's apparently still happening, but I haven't seen any update on it at least nothing public. So do you know if they've gone back to the drawing board and maybe fix some of the things that a bunch of people had issues with or have have they you know given up on that idea yeah i mean and I, i'm sorry I, I just see all the stuff in the channel now but let, let me um so in terms of mobile coin so so moxie was making the same complaint about bitcoin that lots of people make he's just like uh, you know, this you need to do faster transactions, which which is which is reasonable. And and the reason why I do have a lot of respect for Moxie is that even though he is basically you know at heart a cypherpunk, uh, he is trying to get a billion people to use Signal. And he's actually you know had if you look at Tor, Tor's growth kind of has I won't say it's stalled, but it's not been huge over the last few years. You know, they got to two million users a day, and that's kind of where they've been. Um, Signal, on the other hand, went from like kind of 2 million users a day to like, I don't know, man, like I think it's up to like maybe 100 million or something crazy right now. So they, they're having, they're, they are scaling really fast. Um, and so Moxie, when he said, well, we should have a payment system, obviously he wants that payment system to be fast. The problem with, with, with mobile coin is that mobile coin basically in order to get privacy, we're going to rely on SGX. Uh, yeah, which is which is something I, I I'm not a huge fan of, and um, yeah, now, I'm not against trusted enclaves. I'm t I am against trusted enclaves controlled by Intel, and there's a reason Intel has a trusted enclave under it, its control because what it doesn't want is SGX-driven crypto ransomware. 
That's what they were really worried about. That's why they want a death switch. They could turn something off, even if it's an SGX. I never even thought about that before. Yeah, wow. that, that's if, if you talk to SGX people, that's I mean, that is why Intel has a kind of kill switch on the whole thing. Uh, that being said, my complaint against a, a secure enclaves is is more based not on conspiracy theories on Intel, even though those are all basically true. It's more based around just physics, which is there is no magical way to make anything trusted. And there's no magical way that you're going to prevent side channel attacks. There's no magical hardware. There's just no it's just, anything you build. It may be better than the last thing. We'll have some new side channel attack because physical reality leaks information. And so for us, you know, I think it'd be fine uh, if people want to integrate us against, you know, enclaves. And uh, there's some interesting work in open source enclaves from Oasis and other folks. Uh, that being said, uh, would I put my trust in an SGX based system? Would I put a lot of money in it? I mean, I might buy a pizza over it using, but I'm not going to put my my savings as you know my savings in it. No way. And so, uh, yeah, I felt it was a I, I I wasn't that interested in that design. That being said, you know, Moxie did review some of the early NIM designs, and you know, he's still interested in mixed nets, but also the, he's really. You know, he, he's not a big fan of decentralization, and his belief is decentralization may not scale to what Signal wants. Uh, and so he's worried that if we have this decentralized mixed net, which is what exactly what NIM has, uh, that, you know, somehow a node will fail. And his concern isn't that the node will fail, it's that the node will fail because, you know, John and in Indonesia – so Raspberry Pi got turned off or something like that. And that people, they won't see the mixnet failing. They'll see signal failing and they'll blame him. And I think that's a reasonable concern. That's one we're working uh, to address. So let me go. Um, wow, there's a bunch of stuff in the channel. Um, let me just, yeah, I do. I mean, I, I wouldn't trust any trusted hardware off of off the top of my, top of my head. Um, in terms of... Tor and mix that. Let's just go back one second. So, so yes, yeah, Serbs and um, mix that's general predate Tor. Uh, again, people who are working on Tor, we're working on mix that's beforehand. But it's important to remember that uh, they are both generic. You can send message based traffic through Tor, you can send cryptocurrency Real through quick Tor. For the audio, you want to explain what the Serbs is? Uh, that's, that's only in the chat. Oh, okay. Serbs, I mentioned them very briefly. They're called single-use reply blocks. So let's say I send you an anonymous message, and you used to, in order to do that, what you used to do is you used to have use a server called a NIM server, literally called NYM, just like that's where our company gets its name from. And the NIM server would give you a pseudonym, and it would let you send that email through. And in later versions of this, the NIM servers, what was called the cypherpunk remailer, you know, would let you have a response back. But the problem is you really, if you really make that anonymous – you basically need what's called like a sort of Dropbox or rendezvous point because I don't want to send the message back to your IP address. I would then know your IP address. I don't want to send a message. I want to send a message to some other IP address, some node in the mixed network, and drop my message off there. And at some later point, you anonymously pick that message up. And the way you do that is rather than saying, here's my email address or here's my IP address, um, you basically have a drop box, which is like, you know, a key, a, a, a public key of a mixed node, you drop your message off there and it's retrieved uh, in the future. That's a, that's a single use reply block. And while mixed nets were originally used for anonymous email, I want to be very clear, they are now generic. They might not be well suitable for, let's say, web traffic. You can definitely try to do web traffic over them. I'm almost certain someone will do that on top of NIM. And they, you know, and, and there has been some experiments, some things, uh, UDP based traffic, such as traffic that we use, for example, voice communication. Uh, Mumble is pure UDP. U Tor is purely TCP IP. It actually doesn't cover UDP. Uh, BitTorrent is UDP, for example. These kinds of traffic, there is theories that these might actually work well on mixed nets because if I'm doing a voice conversation over UDP with you, it's okay if I lose a few packets or a few packets arrive late as long as most of them get there at a reasonable amount of time. And Lupix has a number of tricks to kind of optimize that time. And we think, you know, we think that voice over a mixnet is something that is not inherently impossible and maybe possible and something we're definitely interested in trying.
And so what we're interested in doing is we're trying to – because our mix then is generic. It's not just for email. We want to mix email traffic, Bitcoin traffic, maybe even voice traffic like mumble traffic or file sharing traffic. Mix that all together to make everyone uh, more anonymous. Now, there is a trade-off uh, between the message size – the speed of the traffic, how many servers you have, the capacity of those servers. And NIM currently solves this. It's a very hard problem. Uh, we currently solve this using a, a, a simulator, which basically looks at the traffic coming to the network and tries to optimize uh, the parameters of the network. So just as uh, so, probably the, the the NIM mix that will operate in a series of what we call epochs or timing rounds, and every timing round, a little bit like how Bitcoin adjusts the mining difficulty, we will adjust some of the parameters in the network to try to optimize uh, the latency and capacity of the network while maintaining a level of entropy so that we for the messages, so we can remain we can guarantee a kind of level of anonymity. For each of the users so to kind of like dumb that down if i recall right from the paper that that's pretty much um how you kind of try to set a constant bandwidth level and then within that like tune the amount of fake versus real traffic to kind of just keep the overall levels smoothed out yeah but the difference between nim and lupix is that lupix basically assumes there's one network and it's not growing or shrinking in NIM, we, we take the basic Lupex design and we make it dynamic. We say, well, look, what if more nodes come on board? What if traffic just spikes? What if it increases or what if it decreases? And that's how, that's how we've changed Lupex fundamentally so that it can basically deal with different kinds of traffic and continually not just – figure out how much dummy traffic to add, but actually what happens if the underlying bandwidth changes and make that bandwidth go up or down um, and, and optimize that usage of the available bandwidth. Okay, that's that's actually pretty cool. Is it, I, yeah, you know, like I said, I kind of dove through the, the Lupix paper. I, that's a pretty useful change to things. Yeah, and we have something that's – and we in order to do this, actually it was it – was, um, it was Adam Back that inspired us. So, at, you know, in 2016 – I was, I think I was with Adam at a crypto conference. I think it was financial cryptography. And I said, Adam, if, if there was one thing in Bitcoin that we could change, what would it be? And he kind of said, well, it'd be nice if all that computation did something useful for privacy. And I said, that's a good idea. And we went away and we currently have this new unpublished scheme, but we'll publish it. We're still working all out. We're, um, you know, in Bitcoin, you have to solve these ha these these merkle puzzles this 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 hashing problem and what we do is we have instead of having miners we have mixers and the mixers have to instead of proof of work they're doing a, a special kind of work which is mixing traffic they're shuffling this traffic around and it we so we do have kind of proof of mixing technique and this proof of mixing technique basically involves sending fake traffic a kind of through the network uh, with the path and network chosen by VRF, verifiable random function, which is provably fair and random, and then we check to see if someone has delivered the traffic or not. And we, we use several features of Sphinx, such as the nonces, which are used to replay attacks, to basically prove who has or has not delivered traffic to some extent. And then we can reward or punish those nodes based on if they've delivered traffic. So you have someone... And, you know, some place puts a Raspberry Pi on the network and, it, you know, the network getting hammered by, let's say it wants to have, you want to have fast traffic and the Raspberry Pi can't handle it. We have a way to automatically kick that Raspberry Pi out. And if you put on a new node in NIM, um, I, let's say I get a giant server in my secret cypherpunk hideout in Berlin and I put that traffic online, um, then the capacity of the whole network goes up and then we can then optimize that capacity uh, using this kind of uh, proof of my, of mixing technique. So that, that's kind of the main things we've changed in Lupix. There's a few minor changes, um, but the main thing is be able to dynamically estimate uh, the traffic and then use the dynamic estimations to optimize the system parameters and that basically make the network itself dynamic to be able to grow and shrink uh, in response to demand, and a lot of the, for a lot of that stuff, we you know, there's no solution better than the free market for a lot of these problems, and we use sort of free market techniques, but adopted cryptographically 
uh, to work in the mix that setting so we can prove that people are mixing traffic or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like a really solid way to kind of handle the uh, the growth issues with Lupix. But, um, you know, I think uh, going to kind of try and shove us off into some of the, the stuff on coconuts and anonymous credentials because uh, <laughs> we're, we're like 45 minutes in and we haven't even gotten out of Lupix yet. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you want to run, I mean, I mean, Lupix is and Nim is what we have working now. So if, if people go to our web page and they click on the docs button, this, you can download that Rust code and install it. You don't need SGX. I mean, it'd be better if you put in a decent server than not a decent server. But I think you know the the the, the work on anonymous credentials comes from a related problem, which is you know what we want. This actually was inspired a bit by Snowden. When he at one of his speeches, he said, "Well, I want to be able to prove that I have the right to access this network, and you know nothing else about me." And we also have this problem where you know there might be everyone hates that thing with Signal; they have to give their phone number away or some personal data. Yep. Um, and we don't like it either. And so our theory is that uh, this older technology, which uh, is called anonymous authentication credentials is the way we can kind of kill two birds with one stone. We can sort of say, we can use anonymous authentication credentials to prove that you're not doing a Sybil attack without us knowing who you are. And that's quite useful because we don't want, you know, uh, I don't know, some sort of spammers to overrun our network, which was a problem with Mixnets and when the anonymous emails when they first came out. That's why Adam Back kind of pushed out Hashcash. And second, um, we can then the the service provider can then ask for information to set up a, an account like a Signal style account or a Bitcoin address without revealing anything without being able to link the user to the account in a in a in a way that de-anonymizes the user because the mix that's like really solid on the network level and if you build an anonymous app on top of something that's not solid network level is like building a castle on sand it will fall apart uh but 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 um the application if you even you have a mix that and the server is like yo type in your real name well you've just linked yourself it doesn't matter that your ip address is disguised it doesn't matter that the time your traffic pattern is disguised if you just gave that server your real name and not a NIM or a pseudonym or something, and that server gets seized, you've just, you know, that app gets hands over the data to an adversary, you've just been screwed. So we needed a generic framework which, which let people both access the MixNet anonymously and provide information anonymously. And that's exactly what anonymous authentication credentials do. And Coconut's just the latest and greatest anonymous authentication and credential scheme, also a product of the genius of George Denisis. And uh, it, the main thing that Coconut does is it takes anonymous credentials, which are well known, but historically a bit like Chami and eCash centralized and uh, redoes the cryptographic math in a decentralized setting. So you could have multiple validators that validate your credential rather than just like a single authority. Yeah. One of the, the interesting you know things about Coconut um... – at least, you know, I, I, I didn't actually get the chance to read through the whole paper for that. I just read um, a piece you wrote on it that Theo sent me. But the, um, what is it, the, the mutatable signatures, where, where you can actually just constantly mutate a signature into a new signature that remains valid. And Yeah, like that, that's that, a really nice topic. Like, I didn't even know that was something possible before I read that. Yeah, it's not only possible, it's even better. So how Coconut works is you, so you imagine you have a, a kind of blind signature, but the problem is I'm sending packets around a mixed net and, you know, or whatever, uh, some sort of a uh, network. You don't want that signature to de-anonymize you. If I don't know where you're going, if I see the, the signature more than once or twice, I can link those signature usages. So you need to re-randomize the signature. Uh, and if, if you know crypto, you know, re-randomization is actually quite an old thing. It's just usually you just kind of add an exponent and you take the exponent off. El Gamal does it. Uh, but but re-randomizable or mutatable is one way to think about it. Signatures are, 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 particularly, are quite nice because you can get signatures which can be verified, but the signature itself 
uh, can be re-randomized at every usage. And that, that's what gives you the unlinkability between usages. But the second thing uh, that anonymous authentication credentials based on Coconut do, which is new, because other people had figured out that re an unlinkable trick before. The thing which does which is new is it says, well, look, we don't want a central authority. So we want to combine this kind of re-randomizable blind signature with what's called a threshold signature scheme, which is aggregate, so that we can sort of say, well, you know, we got multiple parties sign this thing, combine their signature, mutate it, re-randomize it every hop, and then if I want to verify it, you know, I only need the verification keys of, for example, two-thirds of the uh, validators in the system to, to prove that it's valid. And that's, I think, quite useful because that naturally – uh, let's coconut be used in decentralized systems, uh, you know, blockchain-based systems in particular. Yeah, you actually have like a a pretty decent uh, threshold for failure that way, as far as not taking the whole authentication system down. Yeah, and also it's really nice, even from an anonymous perspective, because if you had like a, you know, if you look even at what Signal does with groups right now, Signal has this nice unlinkable scheme based on this. Uh, advanced cryptography called algebraic max, but it's still centralized. And, you know, if the signal servers go down, then you can't authenticate to your groups anymore. You're kind of screwed. Uh, and with coconut-based anonymous authentication credentials, they work in a similar way, but, you know, up to one-third of the servers can be down at any time, which is just necessary in a decentralized environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, you know, that that, that kind of whole... Like the the primitives involved in coconut, I think can go way beyond like just applying for this type of digital credentials, um, you know, for system access. Um, you know, it's like specifically, um, you know, my brain went to the whole contract tracing system. Um, you know, I've seen you talking a lot about proposals for systems in Europe. If you might want to dive into that topic. Yeah, I mean, so you have all of this stuff going. I mean, just to be clear, a lot of people are very interested in anonymous authentication credentials and how they can be used to enable, you know, private side chains of Bitcoin, all sorts of private stuff. I know at some point you might want to get Amir Taki on the show. He can go deep in all that stuff when he's ready. He's, I believe, working in that space. We're not. We're just using anonymous authentication credentials to access a mixnet. Uh, that being said, it's very generic technology and. You know, this contact tracing stuff in the Chrono space has gotten very hectic, um, mainly because, you know, contact tracing is obviously useful. If you know someone's infected, you want to tell other people who they've met to, they should report their infections. But then do you really want to create a massive surveillance state based on monitoring everyone's, for example, phone locations to, to not do so? So there's been a lot of proposals for Bluetooth based contact tracing system, some are more decentralized than others. I'm, of course, promoting the decentralized and privacy-preserving ones. Unfortunately, it looks like a lot of the European governments, particularly Germany and France, are moving to centralized ones. The, what proposal we've seen in the United States are even worse because they tend to be based on uh, GPS phone data rather than uh, – which is very basically impossible to anonymize. Well, at least with Bluetooth data you can try. Uh, but the, the, the thing which no one's talking about, which I actually find – scarier than this tracing is this uh, this concept of immunity passports, right? That either I've, depending on what country, either I haven't caught COIVD-19 or I have caught corona. You have to prove that, to have the ability to travel, the ability to go to work, I don't know, the ability to go outside your house. And, you know, I, you know, I'm not against science. I don't believe, you know, I, I'm, I'm currently isolating at home and quarantined and just working a lot. I, I take the advice because I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, that being said, I don't want a surveillance state. I don't want to have uh, a new kind of kind of yellow star I have to display or not display just because I have corona and I don't want the government to have that information uh, that they could weaponize against me in the future. And I think anonymous authentication credentials could be used – in uh, in a lot of these technologies, we actually have a you know we we we've poked around and to be honest, people haven't been as interested as we were expecting they were going to be. But we're still going to push uh, more privacy enhanced technologies in the space. The problem is not that the technology doesn't exist. Um, 
you know, the the problem is that governments in general are actually against uh, solutions like anonymous authentication credentials, uh, which do not maximize their surveillance. Um, that's at least what we've seen in the debates with France and Germany inside Europe and the DP3T versus PEPPPT debate. Terrible acronyms. And I, 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 I doubt it's going to be different in the United States. So, um, yeah, it's a dangerous world war entering. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, PEPPPT uh, stands for the Pan European Privacy Preserving Pro- Proximity Tracing Project. <laughs> Well, yeah, and and this it's true. The guidelines advocate for privacy. They advocate for decentralization. But what happens is that the governments basically say, well, it's a national crisis. It's a national emergency. And all this great EU stuff, there's this process called derogations. We can throw it out the window. It's actually the same technique that was used by Britain to enable G- the GCHQ to spy – on transatlantic internet cables. So when the NSA needed someone to really do their dirty work, they called up their friends in Britain at GCHQ. They would do that dirty work for them. And how is that possible? Because at least at that time, Britain was part of the European uh, Union, and therefore they had data protection laws. They had laws to protect privacy. But Britain said, well, look, guys, it's national security, so we can ignore those laws because it's an emergency. And, of course, with terrorism, there's always an emergency. And uh, it's the same with corona, that you know, there's all this talk from, I think, well-meaning people and, and very nice academics. NIMS scientific board is – half of them are working on uh, DP3T, which is the Decentralized Privacy Enhanced Contact Tracing stuff. Carmela Troncoso, who used to work on Mixnets, Bart Purnell – who also worked on mixed nets. Uh, and, but push comes to shove, the government will be more than happy to let a bunch of nice people work on decentralized privacy and stuff. But what we've seen in the last week in Europe is when push comes to shove, the governments will demand, I want the entire social graph of everyone who's ever met a corona patient. I want to know who's been infected and who's not. And they'll push for that data even if the scientists, the people who work in um, epidemiology – such as uh, the Italian fellow Chiro, who just resigned from PPEPT, say we don't even need that data. Um, and, and that's, I think, rather sinister, and that's a, a bad sign of what we may have coming out after corona. So to be frank, we're trying to build this mix net and all this credential stuff uh, to complement Bitcoin and other tech as soon as possible. Because we, I don't know, I'm a little bit worried about the surveillance dystopia we're going to be stepping into uh, after corona and how corona will essentially make governments – uh, you know, earlier the paradigm was we need to have surveillance to stop terrorism because they may kill you. But the fact of the matter is very few people were killed by terrorists. Uh, but now, now they say, well, we need to have this surveillance mechanism for your own good, for public health to stop corona. There will be the same mechanism, uh, the same, as Snowden put it, architecture of oppression uh, that they've been building the whole time. And it's it's quite scary what we're and we may have a limited time to stop it coming into being. Yeah, and like even the the, the Bluetooth based things like Google and Apple's proposal, there's Bluetooth beacons everywhere scooping shit up for advertising. Like China's yeah. passing out drones to American police departments like candy, like. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point that you made about the Bluetooth advertising. So even in the very privacy-enhanced versions of Chrono Tracing, this is my main critique of DP3T, um, where it's like, oh, don't worry, it's decentralized. Even in that case, if you know, you're not just talking, your Bluetooth advertisements are not just being seen by other nice people. They're being seen... By even the Google and Apple proposal, by all this ad tech and Google and Apple and Facebook, I'm impressing Bluetooth BLE advertisements as a tracking system for friggin' five or six years now. It's in every Walmart and store in the US. And those Bluetooth based systems, I mean, maybe on some level you have some privacy on in theory and paper, but in practice, all that Bluetooth data about who has Chrome and who doesn't is just going to get sucked into all the advertising technologies in this in Silicon Valley. And that's, I think, kind of dangerous. And it's hilarious because what you see in Europe now is Europe is basically saying, hey, Apple and Google, can you change your architecture so that, not, so that we can also get this data? We want to know this data. 
Uh, so yeah, it's um, there's no Bluetooth panacea, unfortunately. Yeah, so it's like, what do, what the fuck are we gonna do here? Like, I've just been leaving my phone at home whenever I go out. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's what people. I mean, I that's what people should do. People should leave their phone at home. Um, in general, people should use mobile phones less, and uh, you know, people should become more should use privacy enhanced technology more you know even technology like such as mumble is a huge jump ahead for voice above uh zoom and all this other stuff and i i think you know eventually you know people will wake up um as the you know the the oppression caused by the general economic crisis gets worse and worse that's at least what i hope will happen well, and the other thing we have to worry about is that I actually, I see, like, if they mandate the use of these tracing systems with Bluetooth, as was described uh, by Apple and Google in their partnering blog post, there's a huge risk, because basically at the moment they're saying it's just going to be based on self-reporting, so you have to manually input the data, but of course you could lie, and there are going to be people out there who just want to, you know, fuck with people and pretend to be positive. And that's, that's going to ripple through whatever social graph they might have built, whether it's fake or not. And that's going to, you know, that's a danger. Like you're going to potentially affect like a lot of people's lives, like thousands to millions, depending on how big your social graph is with the, you know, six degrees of separation and whatever. Like that's that's like an attack vector that's probably more dangerous than you know not having something like this. Yeah, I mean they 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 try to get around these attack vectors by saying oh the healthcare system will have to certify that you've been infected, et cetera, et cetera. But you know who knows what people do for the lols. Um, not even the lols, Harry. I don't like what you're saying right now about the government. You have to take a test. You failed. Can you imagine trying to take any kind of revolutionary action or coordinate something in an environment like that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you don't want uh, – I mean, I think uh, you, you don't want to have to display an identification card or passport to go outside. And you don't want to make it illegal to leave your phone at home. You don't want – I mean, and it's almost guaranteed. I totally agree. They're going to try to make carrying your phone and having it on all the time – Mandatory. The main reason Google and Apple released these Corona APIs was so people could not turn them off and so that they wouldn't kill your battery life. So they could be on all the time. And yeah, that that's really dangerous. I, I do honestly hope people protest against it. And I do think uh, a revolution may be needed to defeat the coming global surveillance state. 100%. Um, that being said, I also want to point out that a lot of the surveillance technology we've seen and a lot if you just look at the Snowden revelations they're very interesting in this regard the government will often have a lot of capacity to do surveillance um you know they have as many hard drives as they need infinite computing power but what you see is they aren't very good at it very few of these mass surveillance programs ever detected a terrorist most of these corona apps we're already seeing experts saying will be full of false positives it's a mess no one will use it it's going to be it's going to hurt more than it's going to help and and you know uh, the, the amount of general incompetence in centralized government systems is sort of amazing just sheer old fashioned bureaucratic incompetence and so i do think i don't want people to come away negative saying well i'm going to enter the surveillance state and then i need to be afraid all the time because the surveillance state is just the Governments um, and you know large corporations are trying to deal with this world which is very complicated, and they really want to reduce it to something that's simplified they can control and predict. But the fact of the matter is, you can't predict people. People are crazy. You won't be able to control and surveil everything. The world is very big, and people will revolt against it. And nothing they can do can stop it. So I, I'm, on some level, even though I think the technology being pushed against this is very dangerous. I'm kind of positive about the future because I think at a certain point, maybe the corona crisis might be the tipping point. Uh, people are going to push back. Well, in the, the, the times you've been saying, like, they could mandate that people don't turn off their phones or 
don't leave them at home. Like, I don't know what they're going to do about phone free people like me who don't have one of these surveillance tracking <laughs> devices. Like, are they going to force me to buy a phone? Are they going to like provide phones to everyone who doesn't have one just so that we can carry it around with us? Like that, that's the only way that you're going to get me to like carry a phone around that tracks me is if you're basically, you, you know, you're, <laughs> you're bringing it into my house and strapping it to my body or something. Introducing yeah. the international edition of the Obama phone. Too poor for a phone? Don't worry, the government will give one to you. The Affordable Phone Act. I'm sure they'll do something like that, but that being said, like, and in fact, in Europe, they're saying, well, if you don't have a phone, we're going to mandate, I think it's Austria, that you have to wear this particular Bluetooth device or something. Oh, my God. Um, so this stuff is all coming. Wow. Um, to go outside. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I, I think people will fight back. At least I hope so. Better be waterproof. Yeah. And that being said, you know, we still may have, you know, the, the, the corona is hitting so fast and so hard. Um. You know, the, the way I view is we, you know, I mean, we still have time to build this, pri this, this privacy tech. And the thing which I, I really appreciate about Bitcoin, which I think is hard for even people to explain, is that for so long, people were trying to build privacy tech. And there was basically no interest, or if there was interest, it was from, you know, small groups of people. Um, and there was basically no money. Traditional venture capital uh, wasn't going to invest in privacy tech. Uh, the state would only invest in privacy tech that it knew it could defeat. Um, that was private, maybe against, you know, like the U.S. wanted people to use Tor. Uh, so that people in Iran could use Tor, but the U.S. wasn't interested in building a system which it itself could at least theoretically not surveil. And um, and it's quite, you know, and the Kronos hit hard. You know, Tor had to lay off about a third of its employees uh, yesterday. Um, that being said, you know, Bitcoin might be what saves us because all of a sudden, you have lots of people who are, you know, all people who got in earlier, very interested in privacy, very interested in the ethos, the private, the cypherpunks uh, works. And all of a sudden these people actually have, you know, real capital deploy. So I'm hoping that the kind of surveillance tech capital, I mean, even though it's huge, uh, can be defeated by people supporting privacy tech. Um and I think that that's something that that historically, if you look at it, that's that's what can let me convince George. Even though eventually he moved over to to Libra because they gave him a, so much money, we couldn't argue against it. But it, I did, I have convinced a lot of friends, and and it actually convinced folks like Dave to quit Libra. You know, you know he he left Libra and now is now working on Nim. Uh, that privacy tech may have a chance now that it's never had before. Uh, it's mostly because of of the the, for lack of a better word, the monetary uh, redistribution of value that Bitcoin's caused. And yeah, it's very much a minority, but it's a it's a it's an active minority, and and that's more important than it, it seems. I mean, also remember that you know, for example, folks like me and George and Claudia working on Nim, we were we were desperate to even get you know, two hundred three hundred k five years ago. And now we can get investments of, you know, we got an investment of $2 million to build them. And that's, we couldn't even believe that when we got it. So, you know, and we're doing, and, and people who are dedicated can do a lot with a small amount of money. Um, you so, know, yeah. I, th I think that kind of uh, pulls us, you know, I think Janine wanted to go back and touch on um, the comment you made earlier about how you, you kind of think that most of the other crypto communities aside from bitcoin and a few others don't really care about privacy yeah it's true i mean um i don't know i mean we 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 you know like i said we're an open protocol so we've talked to everyone and and to be honest we've been mostly impressed with blockstream and and the bitcoin community uh, we have talked you know the zcash community uh not the zcash foundation but zuko and electric coin company have been supportive and folks in the Monero community have been supportive. Um, you know, we were expecting to see support from the Ethereum community, the Ethereum Foundation. You know, uh, you know, I talked with Vitalik about making that some privacy. They have all the zero knowledge proof stuff going on in Ethereum, but then he didn't seem that interested. 
Um, and Ethereum Foundation definitely, yeah, they weren't that interested. And I think the reason is pretty simple, which is they don't need zero knowledge proofs for privacy. That's not their goal. Their goal is, to, is for succinctness to make mm -hmm. ZK Starks scaling. Or for scaling. Yeah. And, you know, mixed nets aren't definitely aren't going to help you scale. They're going to probably increase your latency somewhat. And that's something that they don't want and they're not pretty interested in. Um, and, uh, you know, other folks, you know, it's been interesting. I mean, you know, Brave, Brendan Ike and friends have been huge supporters of, of privacy. Um, actually, kind of weird. Ta the folks around the Tezos community actually seem uh, very genuinely interested in privacy. And, uh, you know, um, we haven't received any, you know, funding or anything from Tezos. But, you know, <laughs> when we have business problems, I, I, I don't mind calling Arthur and asking for his advice. And he's, he's very, been very good on that level. Um, and then, uh, no, actually, uh, we actually got all the European, uh, union NGI. We did actually ask the European union, uh, for help because we thought they'd be sympathetic, but they didn't uh, give us any funding. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so w w I think that there's different levels of interest in, in privacy in different communities. And, uh, but we, we've been shocked at the lack of interest, um, from some communities and, and pleasantly surprised by interest from others. Yeah. I oh mean, my that's... God. Wait, is that a, is that a wild Chris Ellis? <laughs> Yo, I, I just had one. I thought it would be a good segue. I just have one simple question, which is um, how is NIM funded given what you've uh, just gone through there, Harry? Yeah. So, so, so NIM is funded. I'll just be very honest by private capital. Um, so the research was funded by a European Commission research project, so that's true. Uh, and that research project ended in, uh, it was supposed to end in 2018 and kind of drifted on to the early parts of 2019. And that project was called Panoramics, and that's all online, it's all open source, that's what gave birth to Lupix, and some other bits from some other projects called Decode and uh, NextLeap. But instead, we we went towards private capital. So... And including some folks here, people, you know, a lot of Bitcoin Maxes probably hate, but who are actually very supportive. Uh, Binance Labs, um, a lot of the people who invested in Chainspace before they were bought by Libra, because uh, Face uh, moved their funding over to us, Eden Block, Limnus Cap, uh, these kinds of folks. Um, interestingly enough, we have no um, American funding. Um, all of our funding is either European or uh, Asian capital. And you know we've received a lot of criticism for that. They're like, oh, you know, you're, you know, you're you're selling out. But then, to be honest, if you're going to build a system um, that you want real users, we think business models. You know, you have to choose. I'm very critical of capitalism, but let's choose an appropriate business model. Let's make sure it scales. And I've actually had found a lot of my. Uh, communication with folks who invest in this has actually been very positive. I mean, I'll tell you a funny story. I know people probably fucking hate Binance here, but let me. Um, so I actually really funny when I was actually uh talking to CZ about NIM, and you know, there was this this huge, you know, our original thesis was we said, well, who would use NIM? And it'd obviously be uh, uh some privacy coin, right. Uh, and we said, well, who should we choose? Monero? Should we choose Zcash? Should we go with Bitcoin? I hope that Bitcoin adds privacy features in, Ethereum. And CZ just said, whoever gives you the most money. And I was like, that's crazy advice, but okay. But he's kind of right. You know, I mean, at some point you have, you have to go to where the money is. Um, and so what we've seen is even though we start out very open, we have moved uh, more and more towards, we have all the money's currently at Bitcoin. So that's where we're going at. Um, you know, we'll see that the problem is Bitcoin core moves very slowly. Uh, but that being said, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I, it's a controversial decision, but I do think that going after a private investment was the way to go. Sure. Oh. So you, you, do, you don't describe them as venture capitalists there. So they're private investors. And do you have any sense of what their expectations are? What's their exit strategy going to be? Well, I mean, it depends, right? So currently, uh, the system, and this is, you know, the great, ah, uh, the tokenization. The system is not tokenized currently. Um, we are working on a reputation system to basically let them, so one thing we do add is we have nodes coming in and out dynamically. So you need to give them some sort of reputation and some sort of reward. Otherwise, it doesn't make, you know, why would they mix these packets? They'd just be doing it for free. 
And what we've discovered by looking at other systems is that there's only so many people who will run giant servers that ship packets around for free. Uh, particularly if you want a good geographical split and you really want a lot of different jurisdictions involved. Um, so I don't, I think different people have different things they want. I think, uh, you know, obviously, uh, Binance would, would, was, to be honest, uh, two years ago or a year ago when we first started, they were very much pushing towards tokenization. Now, because that market is, uh, kind of collapse, they are not pushing towards that. Um, other people, uh, let's say the chain space investors, let's say Eden Block. Eden Block doesn't really, uh, they don't want tokenization to a large extent. Uh, they're very interested in business use cases. They said, well, what can we do to make people pay for the service? Can we add, like, can we make like a signal plus plus where you pay $3 a month to privacy enhance your message? And other people are saying, well, can you somehow use this to like take a fee? Like imagine there's like you pay a transaction fee and maybe you pay a privacy fee on top of your Bitcoin transaction. So the fo folks are moving, I think, away from the kind of get rich quick token scheme based thinking to trying to find uh, business models that actually make sense. The problem with business models is you do have to say and you have to really bet that people will pay, actually pay money, additional money to existing products for increased privacy. And some people, um, I don't, uh, you know, some, I'm not going to, I shouldn't mention who, some people have said, no, they won't. Actually, people from the Ethereum community have, have some of them have pushed right. back very hard, large capitalists. Exactly. Um, exactly. But yeah. then other people um it's really weird man like people from the theorem community were basically like no one's gonna pay for privacy but then we talked to these crazy people from i'm not gonna again not gonna mention the name but from a giant traditional venture capital firm that funded friggin facebook man like the, i mean we met these venture capitalists these people are so well known as venture capitalists they have like protests outside their house at san fran and some of these people are like I know it sounds kind of crazy, but maybe privacy is going to be the next big thing. And so we're like, gee, so I don't know. I mean, you know, we did it. We ended up not working with any of those folks. Uh, but you never know. I mean, maybe they're right. And I, I think the only way we'll know is to actually build it and see what happens. So we're going to build it. Um, we will. We are looking for partners. If any of you guys out there have apps or know people have apps that would want privacy and ideally pay something for it, uh, or ideally have not used that builder but have the users pay a little bit for it, uh, that's what we're interested in. And we're looking for those partners now. And uh, the mix that works, so you can start trying it out. Um, and that's kind of how we hope. At least that's how we kind of see maybe the Bitcoin angle paying out. Is that we imagine. At least, let's say, 10% of the Bitcoin users would pay like an additional transaction fee to feed the mixnet, basically. Um, I, sorry, I just, want, I just want to jump in because, Harry, you already just uh, hit the nail on the head. The, the reason why the internet is free at the point of use is because it's not really free. And the internet didn't plan to have this mass surveillance model of advertising. It kind of happened that way. You know, and maybe you have a better version of history than I do. But my understanding was Google were scrambling around for business models. And then they looked over at what Bill Grossman was doing and thought, oh, shit, that's a good idea. So let's uh, start selling people shit. Um, and, and then it kind of grew and grew from there. And the, the, so the problem is, and I've said this before, other cypherpunk people, are, you know, we all hang around with, is that if you do replace the current system at the, the protocol layer so that everything is a, a privacy by default, you've kind of broken the business model of the internet and i'm playing devil's advocate i agree with you and i don't like these kinds of um, moderates over ethereum who just say oh well you know nobody's going to pay for it what they're getting to though i think is they're getting to the fact that this feels like a utility that what you're working on right now feels like it should be free of political influence it shouldn't be private companies making it it should just be there like water is there you see what I mean? And so I think the reason why consumers don't pay for it, they pay their ISP for a 24 month contract. So it's basically a financing solution so that they can get a router in their home, right? Because it's bundled together and that's a finance solution. But what they're not willing to do is every time they go on the internet, they have to pay a tax. So what, what they would perceive, what users would perceive as a toll every, every single time they, they interact because then you have a cognitive overhead. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I agree. People, 
you know, we don't have good evidence that people will pay for privacy. And it is true that the surveillance technology system was, to a large extent, unintentional, at least, you know, in the origin. Now it's the standard business model. Um, those are both true. But, uh, you know, what we have seen is that um, certain people will, privacy is, is, is something changed over the last year or two. So the privacy is a user concern. So I would look at, um, Look at Brave. So Brave is a, a browser that claims, you know, increased privacy, and they've seen a lot of user growth. They're taking over from Mozilla basically right now. Um, there is increased. I mean, look at the pushback on Libra. Everyone's like, "Oh, well, I would never trust Mark Zuckerberg with my money." Uh, while Facebook a years ago was generally viewed very positively um, by large amounts of people. So I think we're seeing. In fact, I mean, it's all, hating hating Libra is the only thing that could unite the Democrats and Republicans I've, I've seen in U.S. politics. So I, I feel like what will probably happen is that there will be certain applications which people will pay to be private. I would definitely pay to have my Bitcoin transactions more private. Um, and I think those kinds of high-value transactions – uh, may end up subsizing other transactions that people will never pay for, such as instant messaging. I don't think anyone will ever pay, or at least I find it hard to believe, uh, would pay for like a more privacy-enhanced signal. Uh, but that being said, it's a win-win. If the people who are sending signal messages are using the same techniques, the same mixed network, for example, and imagine a wonderful future, that the folks using privacy-enhanced Bitcoin are using, then they both win because they both have a larger set of piece, people that they're kind of anonymous with. And um, something like that, there may be a business model there if um, high-value users come on board. Actually, one of the most intelligent things uh, an investor told us when we were looking for investment is one investor said, you know, the problem with you guys is all your current user base, because they were looking at the, the kind of non-profit mix net that we were working on, uh, earlier, the the original loop implementation called Cats and Post. They said your user base clearly left wing anarchists, and he and the, and the investor said, "You guys ha don't, ha don't ha you guys right wing anarchists have all of the money." And so, you know, I mean, like, oh, that's an interesting insight. Um, and so, you know, we we're going to have to be very open on this front to figure out a a a working privacy enhanced business model. And it maybe it should be a public utility, but then which government would you trust to run that utility? I definitely wouldn't trust the US government. After seeing, uh, I think Europe is slightly more trustworthy, but after seeing what's going on with the corona tracing here, I think you're not going to see much European government trust. And, you know, I, I don't see any government that anyone would trust. And I, I think the nonprofit model of pure volunteerism actually stops scaling after a certain point because. You know, I've given talks and worked on mixed nets in different countries. And if you go to a bunch of German hackers, you know, like, yo, install the software. It's going to help world privacy. They're going to do it. They have jobs. They have some money. They have a great welfare system. Um, but if you, you don't want your traffic just to be shuttling between Germany and the U.S. You need servers in Africa, servers in Asia. And so, you know, my first talk, my first uh, kind of, outreach effort is we're doing a lot of effort in places of uh, which are not normally part of these communities. Uh, Russia. My first uh, talk actually will be in Africa, uh, in Lagos, in Nigeria, the center of all the uh, anonymous email scams. But that being said, these are the kinds of places where if you come to people and you sort of say, you can make some money by helping make things more private, and we think there's a business here, they may not be interested in a non-profit utility, but they are very interested because they, they lack economic opportunity and are systematically excluded from the economic activity in the developed world. They're very interested in privacy all of a sudden. And a lot of them have to deal on a very daily basis, particularly in Asia, with internet filtering. And the weird thing, you go to, if you go to, to, to the internet, you go to an internet conference in China and you say, hey guys, uh, privacy, it will defend your human right. They'll look at you like you're kind of crazy. They're not that interested, at least the majority of people that I met. But if you sort of say, you know, the fact that you can't get unfiltered internet is that you will lose out on business opportunities. Wow, they are really interested really quickly. 
And so I, I think, you know, I think that's why privacy will have to be more of a global play. And we hope NIM is a global play. And we're, we really want to get users and participants in these places which have due to colonialism and imperialism and bad, just bad local governments, which have been ex historically excluded from Silicon Valley. Um, and even from, you know, and th these countries are the same countries which are, are still very excited by Bitcoin and blockchain because they don't have a functional financial infrastructure as well. Oh, uh, Janine, Chris, you guys got anything uh, more to ask I think there? Shanine, or... I think Shanine wanted to come in, right? Yeah. The, uh, so back to, you made the comment about how the, the Democrats and Republicans kind of united against Libra, but I think that the reason they did that had nothing to do with privacy or them you know, thinking it was a threat for privacy reasons. Um, I don't remember which senator it was, or senator or congressman, but he he very clearly made this speech about how it was a threat to the hegemony of the U.S. dollar. Um, and obviously, Democrats and Republicans, just because they play this whole red and blue game, at the end of the day, their establishment and anything that threatens the you know, the rule of the U.S. dollar is a threat to them, and that's why they took a stand. I don't think it had very much to do with privacy outside of maybe a few outliers like uh uh i think wyden uh was objecting to it for privacy reasons maybe but yeah um and also i it doesn't surprise me at all that ethereum isn't interested because like you know even with uh using zero knowledge proofs for scaling um they're still facing a number of challenges like just for them to continue surviving the next couple of years, like for the network to function, because oftentimes it's not very functional. It's having huge backlogs. And so they are basically, I mean, I think they're on course to basically become a more corporatized project. I mean, they already are very corporate. They have this whole enterprise Ethereum Alliance and partnerships with Microsoft and such. And, those enterprise partners are definitely not interested in, I mean, they may want to build a private version of Ethereum for themselves, but they're not interested in turning Ethereum, the publicly accessible open blockchain, into something that is, you know, privacy preserving. That's not their interest. So it doesn't surprise me that they're not, the rest of the Ethereum space is doing very poorly at that. I mean, we saw this whole thing where, people were registering, you know, domains, ETH domains, and basically doxing all of their coins. It was monumentally stupid. And you had people very high up in Ethereum promoting this and doing it and sucking everyone else in. It's very clear to me that they do not think about that kind of threat model at all. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of, of, of the hegemony of the US dollars, this is where at least myself, I've, I've, I've learned a lot from uh, libertarian, let's say, thinking, um, where I do think that, you know, the U.S. dollar hegemony didn't always exist and it won't always exist. And even Bloomberg published, you know, money is now meaningless. The U.S. is doing all these corona-based outs, most of it not going to small businesses or people. Most of my friends in the U.S., you know, all my friends who basically didn't work in cryptocurrency or tech companies now unemployed – and, you know, $1,200 check is not really going to cut it for two or three months um, unless they live in a very low cost area, which most which of them do. not possible in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, not possible. So, you know, I, you're going to it, – it's, it's – the, the U.S. dollar hegemony, we're going to see increased moves against it. And um, while I'm not like um, – how do you say uh, – hard money fanatic. I, I do think there's a reasonable philosophy in animating um, hard money people and that, you know, people, we will see increased demand for Bitcoin as I do think we're, if you look at things historically, I, I wouldn't be shocked if there was a run on the bank in the US or hyperinflation. If you had told me before Corona, I'd be like, yeah, eventually, but maybe 10 or 20 years, I don't know. No, I'm like, yeah, could happen next year, man. Like things are getting so... Uh, so out of shape of Corona and the uh, the very excellent uh, money uh, machine go burr meme is actually true. So uh, I, I do think that Bitcoin is a good hedge um, against against this. Um, and I hope you know I hope more people get into get into it. Uh, the problem is you know uh, 
You know, the problem is that the, 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 the thing that, that causes all problems is people really do want to get rich quick. And um, I think that's what fueled the initial ICO boom. Uh, that which fueled a lot of the Ethereum boom, which essentially is use case was the ICO boom. And uh, still what fuels a lot of, of law of venture capital. And um, if you think, I, I actually think it's a better thing about things in longer geopolitical cycles, that there's a geopolitical cycle, which is U.S. dollar hegemony, which is ending. No one really knows what's going to come next. Uh, and hopefully the infrastructure we're building uh, will survive what may be nation state level breakdown, which, uh, and th that's kind of how I view it. Um, in, in terms of, Oh, geez, there's so much stuff going on the channel. Let me check what's going on. Uh, okay. Honestly, uh, it's, it's just kind of kind of random banter. <laughs> okay, okay, that. cool. Well, just, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say in terms of uh, KYC and uh, AML check, so that's something that, you know, we, we have to be intimately familiar with. So obviously, um, you know, um, now it's interesting with KYC. So at least here in Switzerland, um, there... Up until very recently, uh, there were no KYC checks for under for uh, withdrawals of under five thousand uh, Swiss franc, and that yep. that 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 applied to Bitcoin. So Switzerland, and, and it's still the case, although now Switzerland, I think, due to international pressure from the FATF, is moving it down to one thousand. Uh, in terms of how NIM will work and how Bitcoin will work in the future. Obviously, the exchanges are going to have to add KYC. This was going to put pressure on people to move to DEXs. Uh, you know, we have a very simple solution to this, which is we believe uh, KYC information, you know, is obviously optional. But if someone really wants it, our system doesn't prevent them from giving that information away. It can just do it in a privacy-enhanced fashion. So only the people that really need to know that KYC information get that information. And that information can be, tra can be sent as attributes in a coconut Anonymous authentication credential. Um, that's our current uh, line on that. We don't have that system entirely working. I, weirdly enough, I also believe, uh, and I have sources, which I won't reveal here, but I believe this is what also, we believe a very similar line is being tacked on uh, by Libra. So I do, I, I do think that Libra is probably going to build on the coconut technology, and hilariously enough, in order to fulfill uh, KYC obligations. Yeah, and uh, hmm. one more thing I wanted to ask, um, kind of related to this uh, topic of funding, is um, you mentioned that you don't get very much interest from American investors, or at least any institutions. Um, and I was kind of wondering, because, you know, we talked at the beginning of the show about the differences between NIM and TOR. Um, and do you think that that reason that there's not as much interest in the U.S. is that if there are people or institutions that are going to or are willing to give money to you know privacy network type projects they've already kind of been sucked into the tour money and they're basically a kind of a competitor to you in that way like not is that necessarily is that um i mean we 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 i mean we're a private company so we're not going to uh apply uh for for u.s government funds um that being said, the U.S. government is building a mixed net. Um, you look up the DARPA, what's called RACER project, or something resilient to anonymous communication for everyone or something like this. Um, there's even work by the U.S. government to build a, a very different kind of mixed net, a much slower mixed net for, I believe, mostly for going through the Great Firewall of China. Um, so there's still tons of money flying around in this space. Uh, the problem is that uh, you know, and I, as a researcher, you know, who comes from academia, you know, it, it became incredibly frustrating getting, having to do grant after grant after grant just to like build something halfway working. And you really do need private capital to get the funding at the scale with the lack of restrictions that you need to build real software. So I, you know, I completely sympathize with, with people who build Bitcoin based companies, you know, um, I think that, that, that it's actually, to some extent, I think, the right model, I suppose. Uh, a nonprofit model is, is very hard. I have a lot of respect for people that can make it work, but I don't think it, it it's. It, I don't. I think it's much harder, and it's much more pain uh, than a, than a for profit model. If you can eventually uh, find a business model, which you know, of course, NIM is still discovering. Let's say, um, and um, 
So we don't. We actually don't consider ourselves uh, competing with with Tor in terms of funding models. Um, we are competing with other privacy enhanced networks that are for profit. Um, that's definitely true. So you would probably, you, know, you could put us as competing against. I think there's like a Monero offshoot called Loki. Um, could be considered competing against. There's like an Ethereum VPN. Orchid, even though not really VPN, but you know, we're, they're, they're, there's there's definitely only so much venture capital out there, and the venture capitalists they have to invest, uh, and you know, because we weren't based in San Fran, and you know, the majority of the team's not American, and uh, you know, the, 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 I think there there was a uh, we I guess we just also didn't have very Silicon Valley vibes, let's say. Uh, we did find it, uh, we, you know, we were unilaterally unsuccessful in raising money. Uh, from both a large scale uh, Silicon Valley venture firms and, uh, and and crypto VC firms that were very uh, kind of I don't know how you say finance or uh, finance driven because we're not we're clearly not a a, a financial um, we're not a financial uh, with there are uses for us in finance I'm sure uh, but we're not a finance we're not like a decentralized finance product so yeah funding's and hard. That being said, you know we 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 appreciate the funding we've got, and uh, so far we don't need more. So we're not fundraising now, and we're just hoping to get that magical product market fit and work through the business model stuff. Yeah, no. I mean, you've probably seen what's been really interesting for me uh, regarding like can privacy stuff have a business model? Um, with you know Wasabi Wallet and Samurai doing the coin joins, there you know that that's an example of people who are willing to pay fees in order to mix their coins, and the mixing process then generates you know money for the business who is writing the software and you know running coordinators and stuff so that was really interesting to see because that's an example of you know a business doing privacy enhancing stuff that can actually get money in a reliable way as long as you know at least according to um their reports they've had more and more users and that's probably reflected i guess in the funding and stuff the fees that are being paid yeah, so you know, we consider those business models sort of inspirations. Uh, we we haven't met the samurai folks. We uh, did go to one of the wasabi reading groups clubs and gave gave a talk on mixed nets and lupix. Um, I mean, I I think that the real question is this is almost a, a a metaphysical question about Bitcoin. Are people into Bitcoin because of the mining fees, because of the value going up, or sorry, the mining rewards, or will at some point fees become enough to replace the Meyer Wars because of the happening coming up. And I think, um, you know, my hope is that not just Wasabi, but eventually the whole ecosystem uh, can build itself around, uh, around fees. Um, that being said, I don't know. I don't think that's the case now. I think only, and, but it is Wasabi and Samurai are both proof that within specialized niche markets like privacy, there are, there's at least some degree that people are willing to pay for fees. Yeah, and you know, kind of, I think this is a good point to kind of circle back a little bit and finally touch on like the, the last big thing I wanted to. You know, you, you were talking kind of earlier specifically about the incentive or the profit model for actually running a node on uh, the mixed network. And, you know, I, I, I want to be crystal clear here none of this is actually implemented. And like the, the software you guys have now is just the mixed net. But, you guys are kind of looking at a token and a blockchain, I think, with proof of stake or a variant of that to kind of try and bake that incentive in a little more deeply. Um, and, you know, I was kind of wondering if you wanted to touch on the, the, the thinking there a little bit. And, you know, I, I'm probably going to barb you a little bit with the, uh, the Bitcoin yeah, maxi response. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of proof of stake, it's important to remember that we we're not doing so. Proof of stake has lots of problems: uh, grinding attacks, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing at stake attacks. These are all well known. And you know, one of our advisors is Agalos, who works on proof of stake systems. Uh, he did the he invented Ouroboros. Somehow ends up working on IOHK, but he's a very smart guy. Before he was working on proof of stake, he was working on mixed nets and has. Probably the only paper app which does provable security around mixed nets, uh, particularly around uh, mixed net email systems. So um, we are 
we did look to Ouroboros, particularly what's called Ouroboros Prowse, which uses a verifiable random function, uh, as inspiration for our proof of mixing scheme. Uh, but that being said, it's not a proof of stake scheme. It's a proof of work scheme where the work is mixing packets. Um, and therefore, in terms of proof of work versus proof of stake, I, I think the way to think about it is that proof of stake is you know, a generalization proof of work. Proof of work is not only solving hash puzzles. It's just as Adam Back said. Proof of work, there, there could be lots of uses for useful work. And one of those uses is computationally enhancing privacy. For it, for users, so I think that I'm I'm okay. I think proof of stake has a lot of security problems. Unclear if they're solvable, to be honest. Um, I am okay and think it's actually necessary to build kinds of proof of work schemes, which are not solving hash puzzles. I think solving VRFs to basically generate traffic patterns to make sure people are mixing traffic is a is a perfectly fine proof of proof of mixing scheme, and that's a kind of proof of work scheme. And that's what we're working on in terms of incentive structure. Now, the problem is, how do you view this as incentive structure? So if you kind of go way back into cypherpunk history, there used to be this company called Zero Knowledge System, which had Zuko and Adam Back and Roger Dingledean. It was like the all-store cypherpunk team on board. And they were trying to build zero knowledge systems and mix nets and all this stuff for commercial deployment. It didn't work. People weren't interested. It was actually very early. It was in the 90s. So there was maybe not as much interest in these systems. And the cryptography wasn't as developed. The internet wasn't as developed. Uh, but one of the most interesting kind of spinoffs of zero knowledge systems, uh, you know, was eventually um, a system which I, I think everyone here should probably be aware of. Um, is I think eventually Zuko ended up involved as well. Mojo Nation. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. I'm not deeply familiar, but um, yeah, I, I kind of am. It was like the a really complicated attempt at like a mixed net slash a e currency system in yeah, like the they early two thousand currency system, and they entered a, a, a hyperinflationary death spiral. So the the, the thing, when, the more and more I look at Bitcoin, the more and more I think what Satoshi got right, which avoided the and and the reason why Mojo Nation ended so badly that many cypherpunks, including the Tor project, basically said incentives will never work. They got so burnt out. They believe it's just impossible. They say if you use incentives, you're going to get so much adversarial behavior that your system will break. That, to some extent, is why Tor is built on this altruistic model where everyone just kind of volunteers relay space, which does make it more of a public utility than what NIM is building. Um, that being said, we think that those models have limits and that they're, they're going to be unable to scale. And real and 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 the, the the you it's better to incentivize people. And where Satoshi was really a genius, I think, really wasn't proof of work mining. Although it was pretty, you know, Hashcash was great. And it's a great use of this of Hashcash. But where he was a genius is he really the the mining rewards, the block rewards mixed with the transaction fees. Um, you know, th this is a very th th even the way he kind of diagrammed out basically by by weirdly enough i believe um from at least what i looked into looking at how gold was mined the, the way he got all those parameters which are very hard to estimate how he got them basically what appears to be correct um is absolutely stunning and that's i think what makes bitcoin work what makes bitcoin really works is is the incentive system um where you, and and i think as, if we're going to run a mix that we're going to need a reputation system and the question is for NIM, which we haven't decided on, is should NIM, so, you know, of course, you have folks like Binance who would press you to do like, oh, just tokenize it, do a token scale. Now, the problem with doing a, a token sale, let's, I'll be very honest. So not only will, of course, people who are involved in Bitcoin hate you, but the other problem is that speculators will seize this currency and will not use it for what it's supposed to be used for, which is, you know, a mixed net, but will use it to mm -hmm. speculate. You went and there that, before I did. Yeah, well, no, it's obvious. And that, and that will hurt the system as a whole. We're, we're not morons. We, we know this very well. Because, for example, if, 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 if the price crashes or goes way up, either are bad. They're both bad. Um, the system becomes unusable. So you have to avoid that. So you have to not allow completely crazed speculation on your system. Um, that being said, you know, in the early days of a mix that we're not sure unless we have business partners that can really pay money and throw lots of traffic through our system, 
we're not sure how we're not sure if we're able to reward the mixers. We have to reward them with something. We have to have at least a reputation system, and it would make sense that if they did their job right, not only would their points go up, but they would get something that they could value out of it that had some monetary value. And you know, I don't know how that can be done. Um, you could you could imagine a case. Let's, let's say you know there could be a good example. Let's say we got a huge venture capital back deal, and then we could set aside a large portion of that to reward mixers for the first year or two as the network's booting up. Um, and it, and that might be the way to do it. Um, and we've seen some systems not launch until they've done that. Another model which I'm leaning towards now, which a lot of our more business minded investors are leaning towards is to say, well, get a business partner that can guarantee traffic and payment for the beginning of the network. And so, you know, to be very honest, we're open on all of this stuff. Um, it's clear that the tokenization stuff is very dangerous, but it's also clear not rewarding people is also dangerous. And it's not, and to be honest, the hardest theoretical problem, which I'm going to be dealing with for the next month, and I'm actually happy quarantine's ha happening, is we also have to sort out the parameters of the system. How much do you charge as a fee? How much if someone misbehaves, maybe they do it accidentally, maybe they drop some pad accidentally, do you really want to kick them out of the system? No, you want them to, to, to have their kind of reputation go down. So we're going to have to return to this question of reputation system structures and incentives. And I'm not as negative as Tor. I'm, I'm sort of positive. I believe Bitcoin and Satoshi got it right once. And if we look very closely at their system, we, there will be insights that we can apply to mixed networks. And those insights have never been applied to mixed networks before. So this is to some extent, I think one of the most exciting things about NIM is if we can do it or not. And, you know, we're giving it a shot. Uh, maybe we'll end in a hyperinflationary death spiral like Mojo Nation. Uh, you know, maybe weird uh, shitcoin speculators will hijack a system if there's a coin. Maybe uh, we'll get enough venture capital funding or Bitcoin will just give us enough Bitcoin that we can fund the whole thing on Bitcoin well, for gonna, two or three uh, years. Exactly. I don't know. I mean, I'm actually very open on this. So I'd like to hear folks' feedback on it. See, I, I just want to clarify one thing for um, listeners. Like when, when Harry's talking about reputation, he's he's talking about the um, directory, like would be the equivalent in Tor. They literally have directory authorities with keys that sign off on a list of all the Tor nodes. And your your notion is to kind of use the a blockchain and this uh, proof of uh, traffic system to kind of yeah, replicate it's a little, that. It's a, it's a little bit more complicated. So in MixNets, in Lupix, we assume there's a static network and everyone knows just keys. In the real world, that's not the case. In Tor, there's a set of directory authorities, which are basically Roger's friends, and he has very good friends, so, so it's worked out very well, which give people the IP addresses and the keys of all the Tor relays. Uh, we think that we can replace the directory authority. We currently, the mix that, by the way, currently has a directory authority. We're going to tear it out this next two or three weeks and put a blockchain in there. Um, and the reason we're using a blockchain is not for monetary transfers or for tokens. What we have a blockchain for is just, it's just a list of who's in the system and who's in and out at any given moment. What's their keys, their IP addresses, uh, who's in, who's out, what's the reputation. We don't have reputation stuff working yet. And that we believe we can store on a series of directory authority servers, which we no longer call directory authority, but we call validators. And those validators are also jointly generate the seed, which is used in the VRF to reward to check the health of the network by this proof of mixing algorithm. So there's not a centralized entity checking people's health, there's a decentralized set of entities. And there's not a single entity maintaining who's in the network and who's out. And, and on that level, we'll have a lot of the same problems as Bitcoin. We'll be vulnerable to things like a tax, uh, you know, essentially a network partition. Um, this is all, you know, the, the, but at the same point, we've seen how Bitcoin has solved some of these problems. And so we think they are solvable, or at least you could deal with them. And what we don't know is we don't really know how to solve the problems of bootstrapping the initial network, I think. Um, and that, that's, I think that, so the PKI and consensus document is not based, it would be based on a, a blockchain. Okay. Um, and then the, the that blockchain will then be able to do commitments to a, a VRF 
based scheme, which basically measures mixing. That's why we use our own chain. We are specifically not trying to be a cryptocurrency because there's already Bitcoin. In fact, there's already too many privacy coins. So we don't want to be a cryptocurrency, but we do want to decentralize directory authority system. And we think a blockchain is a better choice than DHT, which is what I2P chose. Because DHTs are very nice on paper, but in practice, they have lots of attacks. Um, mass, okay, that's an interesting question. So in terms of Sybil attacks on proof of mixing, well, I mean, you can't, you, it's hard to prevent Sybil attacks, but you just have to make it easy to kick people out. So if you do have a big Sybil attack, you have to be able to remove people that are not actually mixing. If they are doing, if they're mixing, it's fine because mixed nets have a very large security boundary. So in a mixed net, you have a route through a series of mixes. And as long as one mix is honest, your traffic is secure and private because the traffic is essentially not de-anonymizable. If you control the whole route, then you're screwed. So we're trying to set some parameters to make it hard for an enemy to control the whole route. Um, so we do, th we do think massive symbols uh, are okay. In terms of validators, um, again, we haven't, I mean, we'll probably, we, we just as the initial mix net, uh, we had a few friends debug the software, then we opened the network, and that's probably going to do for validators as well. Now, I think the question is, that's obviously not fair. So nepotism isn't a great way to design a system. And so it'd be good if there was a more fair way to choose mixes and validators. And validators, somewhat similar to mixes, mixes are chosen based on proof of mixing. Validators have to, choose to be chosen basically if they're online all the time, if they're signing enough transactions. So we can make a way which we think is, is make it so anyone can choose to be a validator, but if they screw up, they get kicked out. Um, that being said, it's, these are very hard problems. So I'm not going to claim we have them solved yet. And that's why you're not going to see a white paper or an academic paper or anything until we've actually solved these problems, but we do think they're solvable. Yeah. And you, you know, to kind of dive back into like the, the bootstrapping issue, I mean, I really do think that Bitcoin and just funding that upfront would be a good way to do that. And I mean, you know, an obvious issue when you start getting Bitcoin involved with payments for things like this is, um, you know, you're giving something to correlate uh, network traffic to. And I think that's really easily solved with Xiaomi and eCash servers. And I think it would be a really simple thing in, in a robust big network to just have a, a web of trust around reliable eCash servers that people could use for those payments. And I mean, given we're, we're talking about bandwidth here, which in most places is pretty cheap. So the counterparty risk there at any time wouldn't really be that high. And you can just net settle um, and pull that out into real Bitcoin in a decorrelated way from the actual network traffic. Yeah, so just because we don't have proof of bandwidth, we have proof of mixing. So if you don't ship a packet through, through the, the bandwidth you have, you, you No, you I just don't. mean that's the resource no, no, I'm being to, paid I'm for. To, I'm talking to the channel, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the thing which is uh, about Chime and eCash, so you know, we've thought about that. And we actually think there's one way you can use Bitcoin to, to, to help you know, build the system out um, would be to actually take Bitcoin – Embed Bitcoin as an attribute. And I think this is even what Libra is going to do with Libra into essentially an anonymous authentication credential. An anonymous authentication credential is essentially a complex version of what Charm and eCash hands out to people, these blinded tokens. Um, and that might work. There may be that some version of Charm and eCash with some of the features of Coconut, which we have to build anyways, basically. Um, and we are building anyways might be a way to solve some of our problems, and particularly if we can somehow do a peg between Bitcoin and a kind of Chami and eCash-driven uh, anonymous credential scheme, um, which would both preserve the privacy of the payments, because obviously, uh, or I mean, also another option is being people are interested in privacy of payments, but we assume people are interested in privacy of payments. Um, and that might be a good solution. That being said, you know, that's, there's a lot of tech work there that hasn't been done. So none of that tech work seems impossible. I think, uh, I think we can do it. Um, I, that being said, it's not going to happen overnight. So our, our game plan is to be very honest is we're first going to tear out the directory authority and replace it with a blockchain based consensus system. Um, 
Then we're going to work on anonymous credentials. We already have all the code for coconut and anonymous credentials in Go. It works. You can download it, but it's kind of slow because it uses credentials use kind of special crypto. Pairing based crypto is very slow in Go. By moving over to Rust, actually, we're using some of this eCash code. We can make it very fast. And uh, then we're going to move to, the, I think, what you're kind of describing, which is the how the mechanics of how rewards would work, which would probably involve a kind of more Chaumian eCash usage of the system. Now, there are people who aren't us independently working on this. Um, Amir Taki is working on this. He'd be a good Doc Digest interviewer. He's a very uh, colorful character and, and a good friend. Um, and I think he's looking at this, these kinds of systems in, in detail right now. And um, I know some of the folks on Libra are looking at these systems, and some of our advisory board has, look, has worked at these systems. So we hope we do think something's possible. But that being said, the Chami and eCash work and how to map that to Coconut and how to map that to MixNet is, I'll just be very honest, uh, the most undeveloped and most sketchy uh, part of Nimr right now. Well, I mean, it's a work in progress. Like, I, I would. You know, my scam radar would be blinging right now if you were on here saying that all of these things were perfectly solved and you have all the answers. Uh, these are hard, fundamental problems people have pecked at for decades. <laughs> yeah, that being said, if one of your listeners happens to have, you know, uh, 10 or 20 million Bitcoin, <laughs> we could solve all <laughs> these problems really simply. No, because it would help. I mean, I think, you know, the main problem we have as a, as a small startup is, is lack of voters. You know, we could scale move much quicker if we had more coders um you know folks here are into open source coding you know we are githubs are public we're accessible in keybase or of more volunteers working on the system um because we do not have enough money to hire that many or anyone really right now uh to work on it full time and uh yeah i think i think you know it's going to take a year or two more's work uh to really be uh ready in the strong sense that being said we're moving really fast i mean I have to say, as someone who's worked both in the nonprofit setting and the for profit setting, um, I have been thrilled at how fast Dave, who left Libra to work and is now working at NIM, you know, people who have worked in a for profit coding uh, coding company, you know, as the, our first system, all this Go code you saw was produced by academics. And uh, Cats and Post was the first loop implementation, again, a non profit implementation. Man, it took like two years to produce that code. Three years, and you know I mean, we I've been we got some talented ex industry for... programmers and re-replicated everything in like three months, six months, faster, yeah, I mean... more performant code. So I, I'm really bought. I mean, I, I do say there's some magic in in moving things to a for profit model if if you can pull it off right. Yeah, I mean, I like is is I. Hold on, how do I put this? Um, if there are not a bunch of people involved in this named Dave, uh, I, I actually uh, got a chance to talk to him two years ago now, I think. Uh, oh, that was I took a trip that to was Berlin. Chainspace or Libra. Yeah, and, um, yeah. I've, I've kind of been paying attention to you guys since you first started um, knowing that it was related to that. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic, hopefully, about where you guys can really take this in the next year or two. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 would, we would kill for more Dave-level programmers. Um, you know, folks like Andrew, who did his master's thesis under George, he's been absolutely killer. Um, and I think there's some advantage to having a for-profit structure. Uh, I mean, the issue with a purely volunteer-based stru structure is, to be honest, I don't know how to say this nicely, you get a lot of really mentally ill people involved. And, you know, a lot of people in privacy – including myself, I'm sure people have called me mentally ill, and maybe I am. But that being said, um, you know, I consider myself, you know, a fairly pragmatic person who really wants to accomplish this goal. But it's clear also if you just kind of let anyone jump in, you can even get well-intentioned, effectively civil attacks or organization from just crazy people, and then the amount of code you can produce and the stuff you get working becomes less. So, you know, we are going to maintain a company structure for as long as possible just because not because we think that's uh, I'm a big fan of you know companies per as such i'm not a you know but we just think it's a good way to structure the coding and it has shown itself to be a good way to structure the production of code right now and i think you've also seen that if you look at like blockstream versus the bitcoin foundation or in some other examples um that being said we, we'd like a, we, and we need a larger open source community right now so that's why we open source all the code released everything a so people can trust it but also so we, we could 
see if we get any more volunteers. We haven't actually got that many volunteers. We've got lots of people writing nodes, interestingly enough. About you know, 30 people just showed up to file nodes, uh, mostly from Chaos Computer Club, but also from a few other places. Um, but we haven't had that many volunteer coders, just a few in and out. Uh, Roberto has been wonderful. Amir has been wonderful. Uh, but we could use more. Well, do you think that, because, I mean, are you thinking of having the nodes run on a dedicated device for this purpose? Or do you think it would be worthwhile to explore having it integrated into existing devices that the everyday person might have? And maybe it just runs in the background and they, they, they should know about it, but they don't have to pay attention to it. And that's not the sole purpose of the device. Or is... I mean... Yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan of general purpose computing, not a big fan of SGX and uh, not a big fan of specialized hardware, um, at least at the beginning. So I imagine we'll, we're not going to do anything specialized up front. Uh, we want to keep our code, so that, not so that you can run it like on anything, although you can. Um, I remember hilariously one of our first nodes was set by some guy who then turned his laptop off and the node went down. But... Um, you know, anyone that can set up a decent server, or even a decent VM, or the VM have some randomness issues, should be able to run a, mic a NIM mix node, um, at least in the beginning. Now, that being said, you know, NIM, due to how Sphinx works, relies on certain asymmetric crypto operations. Uh, will there be some hardware computation, uh, hardware to make that faster? Yeah, probably. Uh, could, you know, and, and we might see some of the same evolution we've seen around GPUs and ASICs. Eventually, or this is hard for me to even imagine from where I stand now, happen with mixed nets. I think that's kind of inevitable. Um, I'm okay with that. You know, to me, people ask if I'm like a Bitcoin maximalist or a, a whatever, Ethereum person or something. And I say, look, guys, like I'm a privacy maximalist. So I'm going to be very open. Whatever works to make a mixed net larger, more private, I, it's not, you know, to have more higher capacity nodes anonymize more traffic that's what we're going to do and um we're going to have no regrets about that because you know we've been working on this stuff since before bitcoin we'll be working on it after if bitcoin crashes uh you know price goes up price goes down we don't really care i mean i, I care a little bit because i have a lot of, you know i have you know but i i'm not it's not going to change our fundamental uh, technical and political project um and i imagine that the market and human beings will just do all sorts of crazy stuff uh including crazy stuff to game the system and crazy stuff to maximize rewards and and the great thing about coming after bitcoin is we've already seen a, how a lot of that stuff is out and i felt like it played out pretty well for bitcoin and that gives me a lot of hope unlike tor and this is my main argument with roger from tor is he doesn't think that these kinds of systems can really work I said, well, we have proof they can work. Bitcoin's proof it can work. And so we can take that model and we can look at how it works with mixed nets and, and, and make something that, that works. And we'll see, you know, uh, history will, will judge our efforts to some extent. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, shit, I think I'm finally plumbed out of all this stuff uh, I wanted to get through, although I think it took uh, twice as long as we were planning. That's fine. It's interesting for me. I mean, you, you kind of hit the edge of we we got all the way to the edge of what we're doing. So, um, you know, I, I can only promise that I'll, I'll, our, I'll, I'll there'll be more code, and we'll ship you papers uh, on these topics as we think of designs for them. Mm -hmm. But I mean, is there anything else you wanted to touch on or get into before we call it wraps? Um, again, I would just bring up the fact that we may have a limited time to deploy these kinds of technologies. So, um. People often take things for granted. We take Bitcoin for granted. We just assume there'll be miners. Uh, we assume there'll be this magical thing called GitHub where all the open source code is. Uh, but, you know, up until a few weeks ago, we all assumed we could go outside and go to a bar or a restaurant whenever we wanted. And history is moving really fast right now. History is moving faster now than it has done in a long time. We may have a limited window to push out cryptocurrency and privacy and technology. So I think... You know, while everyone's in quarantine, it's not the time, of, you know, although, you know, don't kill yourself, but uh, is not the time to slack off. It's the time to work hard to push these technologies out because I do suspect that the world after quarantine will be more driven by surveillance, more driven by authoritarian states. Things which we believe will be legal and we take for granted now will eventually become illegal and will be oppressed and we need to build... Uh, the tools to fight back now uh, rather than later because 
I've been in situations, you know, I've, I've, I was in, uh, I was in Egypt. I've been all in doing Tahir Square. I've been all over the world. And I can tell you the one thing you cannot do in the middle of a war zone or a crisis is build new technology. It's, it's too much. You, it, technology takes a level of concentration, a level of funding, a level of stability, a level of technical soul, which you can't do in the middle of a war zone or the middle of a protest or the middle of a uh, inflationary cups of a currency. It's just because it's just, just, it's too much. You have to worry about food and, and very basic things and your friends and medical stuff. And so, you know, right now we still have a window to work on this stuff and it may not be open forever. So that's kind of what I'd like to end on. Could not agree more. Well, I guess, uh, yeah, on that note, I hope everybody enjoys this. Uh, I've been looking forward to doing this for a week or so now. Um, adios, punks. Take care, everyone. Bye. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah. Yeah, you can have food, sir, yeah.